Okay, so for those who can't remember the legend, I will jog your memory a little. Okay, so it is said that sometime in the 14th century in Singapore, there were a school of swordfishes that infested our waters and the king or the Raja, he actually ordered his followers or men to stand at the shore and line up at the shores and form a barricade so that uh, they can protect the royal family. And this resulted in a lot of uh, sacrificial victims. So a young boy then actually stepped forward with a very clever alternative. Okay, so he suggested using uh, banana trunks. Okay, so here we have banana trunks. Okay, he suggested lining up the shores with banana trunks. Okay, and the idea was implemented. And uh, when the tide came in, the school of swordfishes came and then their bills got stuck among the banana trunks, okay? So this plan was a success. Um, however, the young boy actually incurred the jealousy of the king because the king, the king thought that he was too intelligent and he ordered his men to kill the boy. So deep red blood started to flow down the hill that the boy was living on, uh, which led to the name Bukit Merah or Red Hill. And this legend of Red Hill, right? Uh, he has been referenced many times and passed down many generations. But for today, uh, we are going to um, explore this statement. The fish that attacked Singapore in the legend of Red Hill was likely to be the swordfish. So a poll should be appearing on your screens right now. You can try to answer this question. Okay, so the responses are coming in. So let's wait, uh, let, let's wait a little more for maybe around 70 to 80% of the participants to answer the questions. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll right now. Okay, so uh, 83%, sorry, 59% of you uh, actually uh, voted for likely to be swordfish and 41% of you voted that it's unlikely to be the swordfish. Okay, so it's almost half, half. We are going to explore the answer now. Okay, so the current answer is the fish that attacked the Singapore, uh, attacked Singapore in the Legend of Red Hill is unlikely to be the swordfish. Okay, so uh, this is a picture of a swordfish, but actually today's historians, um, they think that the fish in question is more likely to be this one, the needle fish or the garfish. Uh, garfish is an older term for fish that belongs to the fish family Balonidae. Okay, and how they derive, how the historians derive this, right, was because firstly, swordfishes are not known to be found in Singapore. Okay, and uh, there, are also, there are also very, very few reports of swordfish attacks on humans. Okay, and secondly, the Malay word used in the text that gave us the legend of Red Hills, the Sejarah Melayu, okay, is uh, the word todak, ikan todak. So todak can be considered an umbrella term for small swordfishes, needle fish or garfish. Okay, so this actually led to some historians to conclude that for the legend of Red Hill, it is not the swordfish, but the needle fish that attacks Singapore. Okay, so what are some differences between swordfish and needle fish? Uh, you can tell just based on these illustrations that um, the overall body shape is different. For the needle fish, right, the um, body shape is more elongated and slender. Okay, and if you look at the bills or the snouts of the fishes, for the swordfish, right, it actually has like a sword-like projection of the upper jaw. Whereas for the needle fish, um, the jaw, the upper and lower jaw are almost uh, of the same length. And you can't really tell very closely from this picture, but adult swordfishes or mature swordfishes, they actually don't have any teeth. They usually lose their teeth by adulthood. Whereas for um, needle fishes, they have, uh, they have an abundance of many small and sharp teeth. So that's the difference between a swordfish and a needle fish. Okay, so there are actually a number of species of uh, fishes that are known to be needle fish, but the one that is largest in our region is actually this needle fish in this picture over here, the how needle fish. It can measure up to about 1.5 meters and is also the most probable species for the Red Hill legend. This particular specimen was actually found in St. John's Island in 2013. So the next question you might ask is, uh, why, do, what did the, why did the needle fish actually attack our shores, right? So some versions of the folk tale might mention that this is attributed to a curse. Um, but actually these attacks can be explained by the natural behavior of needle fish. So needle fish, right, they can be described as very easily uh, started or jittery creatures. They are capable of making short jumps out of the water uh, at very high speeds. Even today, right, there are actually occasional reports of accidental human deaths or injuries from being impaled by the sharp jaws of a leaping needle fish. 
Okay, so if you look at the headlines over here, some are, here are some uh, quite recent headlines uh, reporting on injuries and deaths due to stats by leading, leaping needlefish. And most species of needlefish, especially for the juveniles, for the young, right, they, they actually tend to form very large schools swimming near the surface of the water. And let's say when there's any uh, presence of predators or disturbance on the water or there's any artificial sources of light, um, it might actually trigger the needlefish to speed up and dip out of the water as part of probably their escape strategy. So this can be quite dangerous for uh, humans that are engaged in, uh, in water-related activities. Uh, but thankfully, there have not been any records of uh, Singaporeans or humans being attacked uh, in Singapore by needlefish. But now you know that we do have needlefish in our waters and they are likely to be the ones responsible for the legend of Great Hill. Okay. So the next uh, legend that we are going to explore is the legend of Pulau Ubin. So as compared to the main island of Singapore, there are actually more uh, legends or folktales surrounding the origin or the name of our offshore islands. And one of them is actually on the formation of Pulau Ubin, which is one of our wild frontiers, remaining wild frontiers and a treasure trove for biodiversity in Singapore. Okay, so in this legend, uh, there are three animals, a pig, an elephant, a frog, uh, they actually had a challenge to see who would reach the shore of Johor first. And they had an agreement that whoever failed to make it will be uh, turned into a stone. So the three animals, they jump into the water, right? But immediately after jumping into the water, uh, the weather, the skies actually immediately turn uh, dark and stormy and there were huge waves and currents. And none of the animals actually made it to the shore of Johor. Okay, and it was said that the frog, actually turned into an island known as Pulau Sekudu. Okay, uh, this is actually an island that is currently near um, the Chek Jawa side of Pulau Ubin. And it was said that the elephant and the pig, right, uh, they actually turned into uh, Pulau Ubin, which before taking on its single boomerang shape, as you can see in this picture, right, Pulau Ubin was actually once made out of two uh, smaller islands that were then connected because uh, the prawn farmers in Pulau Ubin were actually constructing mud buns for prawn farming. So uh, eventually Pulau Ubin from two islands, it became a single island. So that's the legend of Ubin. Okay, so for today, we will actually explore whether these animals in the legend of Ubin were even found wild in Singapore in the first place. Okay, so we have, uh, we know that we have wild boars in Singapore, right? Okay, uh, the wild pig, this is actually known as the Eurasian wild pig or the common wild pig. Uh, it was actually thought that this uh, species, right, the wild boar, they were actually formerly extinct in Singapore, and then they made a return uh, with individ individuals swimming in from Malaysia. Okay, and then we also know that we have uh, wild frogs in Singapore, wild native frogs. Um, we have about 20 or, uh, 20 or so species of native frogs in Singapore. But how about elephants? Did we have wild elephants in Singapore? We do know that we don't have any wild elephants now in Singapore, right? But do you think we actually had wild elephants or native wild elephants in the past in Singapore? So here comes the next poll question. Singapore most likely had native wild elephants in the past. You take note of the two words native and wild. Okay, the responses are coming in. I think it's a really close fight. It's uh, almost 50 50 percent. Okay, so uh, let me wait for more participants to answer the question. Okay, I will end the poll now. Okay, and I will share the results. Okay, so 48% of you said yes, Singapore most likely had native wild elephants in the past. 52% of you said no. Okay, so close fight. Okay, let us explore this statement. The correct answer is actually no. Singapore most likely did not have native wild elephants. Okay, so uh, this is actually not so straightforward to answer. Reason being, um, okay, in... Uh, the Malay text, the Sejarah Malayu, which is also the text that gave us the legend of Red Hill, right? It was said that Sang Nila Utama, when he came to Singapore um, in the 13th century, right? He actually decided that he wanted to stay uh, in Singapore and he told his messenger to go and inform his mother-in-law, which is the queen of Bentan, which is now Bintan, that he's going to stay in Singapore and uh, if she loved him, she should send him people, elephants, 
and horses to enable him to form a settlement in the country of uh, Temasek, which is now Singapore. Okay, so uh, in the text, it was also mentioned that the mother-in-law actually obliged to his request and she did indeed, indeed send him people, elephants and horses. Uh, but Sangnila Utama himself, right, is actually shrouded in myth and there are actually doubts among scholars today whether he is a historically attested figure or whether he is just a mythical figure. And there's also no other information uh, on this elephant. So even if this story is true, right, we don't actually know whether these elephants were kept captive or they were left to roam around the forest and form their own native population in Singapore. Okay, on top of that, when we look at the British colonial records in the 19th century, right, there's actually no mention of any native wild elephants in Singapore. And you know elephants, they're very huge, um, they're very conspicuous animals, right? And it's quite unlikely that um, the presence of wild elephants have been overlooked and then omitted from the records, especially since our records actually had quite a heavy mention of other wild animals like your wild tigers and wild crocodiles. Okay, so there is, however, evidence that uh, elephants were actually once traded at our ports in Singapore um, during the colonial times, but most likely these are unlikely to be native elephants. So most likely any wild elephants that we have seen in Singapore were actually uh, visitors that were that swam from nearby islands uh, rather than resident or native species. Okay, so wild elephants in Singapore, uh, there are actually two prominent and rather recent records of wild elephants in Singapore. One of them is actually in 1990 in Pulau Tekong. So what happened was uh, there were actually a few, a group of national servicemen that were training on the island and they saw three elephants. Uh, while training on the island. So there was a lot of media coverage and there were actually members of the public that urged the relevant authorities to uh, allow the elephants to remain on Pulau Tekong. But the Singapore Zoo, which was actually put in charge of this matter by the Ministry of Defence then, decided that they, uh, they should send the wild elephants back to Malaysia for the safety of the elephants as well as for the safety of the people on the island. Okay, so... Um, the Singapore Zoo, uh, with help of the Malaysian Wildlife Department, they actually managed to capture and tranquilize the elephants and send them back to Malaysia. Less than a year later, in March uh, 1991, okay, uh, in Pulau Ubin, so there was a young elephant that was spotted at Pulau Ubin, and this young elephant actually uh, caused quite a bit of havoc. It actually uh, injured uh, a resident of Pulau Ubin and chased two French expats, and uh, it also... Uh, damage a taxi. Okay, but uh, eventually nobody was uh, seriously hurt in this incident. And once again, the wild elephant, the young wild elephant was caught and then uh, released to a forest reserve in Malaysia. Okay, so uh, as far as concern, uh, at least uh, ever since we have very well documented animal sightings in Singapore, we probably did not have our own native wild uh, population of elephants, although there were occasional visitors from Johor. Okay. So the next one we have is a myth. It's a story or a case of mistaken identity. So in year 1493, during Christopher Columbus' first trip to the Americas, his company recorded a sighting of three mermaids in the water surrounding the islands of Haiti. Okay, so this was actually extracted from the original uh, narratives of the voyages of Columbus. It was said that Christopher Columbus uh, he quite distinctly saw three mermaids that rose well out of the sea, but he claimed that they were not as beautiful as they are said to be for their faces had some masculine traits. Okay, so um, obviously we all know that what he saw were not mermaids, right? Uh, so let's try to guess what creature did Christopher Columbus mistake for as mermaids? So we, uh, there's no poll question for this. Uh, you can type your answers in the chat box. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the answers we have. Someone said uh, narwhal, dugong, <laughs> sea people, <laughs> fish, stonefish, manatee, dolphin. Oh, we have quite a number of answers. Dugong, walrus, cops, <laughs> a male mermaid, seal. Okay, thank you for your responses. Oh, someone said me. He was just hallucinating. Okay, so sharks. Uh, we have quite a variety of answers. Okay, so... Um, some of you are very close, some of you actually got the answer correct, so I will review it now. So the correct answer is the gentle creatures that 
inspired the mermaid myth in the case of Christopher Columbus is likely to be the manatee. Okay, so um, this is actually based on the location of his discovery. And you might think that it's quite strange for someone to be able to mistake a slow moving round animal for a beautiful fish tailed maiden. Okay, but actually several characteristics of manatees seem to be responsible for this mistaken identity. So let's explore that. So this is a photo of a manatee taken at River Safari. Okay, so um, the mammalian glands of the manatees, right, is actually in under the front flipper. So what are mammalian glands? They are the uh, body part that pro produces the milk for the young. So when a manatee is feeding the young, right, from afar it might look like it's cradling an infant. Okay, which is why some people um, from afar, some sailors might mistake the manatee as a mermaid. Okay, so um. Apparently, right, some people also say that when manatees swim out to the surface of the water with some strands of seaweed covering their heads, it might appear like uh, there's someone with very long hair from afar. Okay, so these characteristics may have also led to some animal, um, led to these animals being mistaken as mermaids. Okay, so on top of that, um, young manatees, they tend to be quite um, pale, uh, cream in color, and the adults, right, they tend to be around brownish or gray. So sometimes the color of the skin uh, coupled with the shape of the body and the distortion of the water right, might have contributed to this illusion that um, there were actually mermaids beneath the water. And in the past, it was said that some sailors, they actually plunged into the sea in an attempt to rescue these creatures. Okay, so um, a lot of people actually answered dugong, which is a very close answer because in Southeast Asia, Okay, for similar reasons, right, we actually had our own case of mistaken identity. But for us, it's the dugong, it's not the um, manatee because uh, dugongs are kind of like the cousins of manatees, um, but they have actually different distributions. And in Singapore, as well as in our region, we can only find dugongs in our waters. Uh, they feed on the seagrass in the shallow marine habitats, okay, uh, the shallow tropical waters. So we don't have wild manatees in Singapore. The only place you can find manatees in Singapore is River Safari. Okay, so you can tell the difference from their tail actually. So for dugongs, right, they actually have a forked tail. For the manatee, their tails are actually more rounded and paddle shaped. So that's the uh, main difference in terms of their appearance. Okay, so in Southeast Asia, evidence of dugong storytelling or human dugong contact, right? Uh, was in the form of 3,000-year-old cave paintings uh, in the Tambun Caves in Ipoh in Malaysia. And this cave art was actually discovered in 1959 by a British soldier. Okay, and on top of that, Dugong is actually said to be derived from the Malay word Duyong, which actually means Lady of the Sea, which is possible evidence that uh, Dugongs were actually once mistaken as mermaids in our region as well. Okay. Okay, in Singapore itself, uh, this is just a fun fact, a very interesting fact related to dugongs is that Sir Stanford Raffles, uh, in, uh, while on a specimen collecting trip in year 1819, uh, he actually caught a dugong and he ate the dugong. And he described the flesh of the dugong to be the most excellent beef, probably because dugongs like manatees, they were known as sea cows. Okay, so that's just a very interesting uh, account for you. And the account he published on the Dugong, right, is actually one of his earliest writings on natural history, and as well as the first uh, on a mammal in Singapore, from Singapore. So if you're interested to read Raffles' account on the Dugong, you can actually click on the link that is posted in our chat box now. Um, this, uh, you can download our ebook, uh, 200 Points in Singapore's Natural History. This book has very, very interesting accounts and snippets of Natural history in Singapore from the year 1819 to the present times. Okay. So we are done with Dugong. Okay, and uh, we're actually on to our last animal for this uh, first segment uh, on folklore. Okay, so uh, this is actually on the folklore and misconceptions related to crocodiles and more specifically the species known as the saltwater crocodile in Singapore. So a lot of folklore in the Southeast Asian region, right, consists of tales and traditions surrounding the crocodile. Uh, and a lot of them have portrayed the crocodile as like a guardian of fishermen, uh, a guardian of waterways, or even a territorial marker and even the embodiment of evil spirits. So there's a variety. Okay, and one very famous folklore that has been passed down many generations uh, regarding a crocodile okay, is this one over here, the story of Sang Kanchil and Sang Boya. 
Kesang Kanchu is a mouse deer, Sang Boya is a crocodile. So in this story, the uh, mouse deer, uh, the crocodile was actually outwitted by the mouse deer because the mouse deer, uh, he has been eyeing his favorite fruit, the uh, jumbo fruit, at the other side of the river, which he cannot come up, uh, he cannot get across. So he actually tricks um, the crocodile into thinking that the king is having a banquet. And he tells the crocodile to line up all his other crocodile friends to be counted for the banquet. And eventually, um, the, the crocodile, right, he gathered all his uh, crocodile friends and he uh, happily obliged, he lined them up, but unintentionally, he forms a bridge for the mouse there, Sang Kan Chu, to get across the river. So that's the story or the folktale that has been passed down uh, many generations. In Singapore, we actually have our fair share of uh, folklore and encounters with crocodile as well. So for example, you might have heard of this legend of a white crocodile that lives in Kalang River that appears every 20 years or so. Uh, though up to today, there's no conclusive evidence of its sighting. Okay, and today, coincidentally, is actually World Crocodile Day. So happy World Crocodile Day, everyone. So we are going to explore the uh, history of crocodile presence in Singapore. Okay, so uh, the very first um, uh, sighting or records of crocodile presence in Singapore is actually uh, in their earliest mention in Hikayat Hang Tua, which is a Malay work of literature uh, written in the 17th century. So uh, the, one of the stories in this literature was that uh, during a visit to Singapore, the Raja or the King of Malacca, uh, his crown fell into the water and he asked uh, his men to um, go down and pick it, uh, pick it up. But nobody actually stepped forward because then it was uh, known that the streets of Singapore was infested with men eating crocodiles. So eventually, right, there was one person, uh, a warrior named Hang Tua. He actually dived into the water and he fought a white crocodile and he managed to retrieve the uh, crown back, okay? But uh, whether the stories of Hang Tua is uh, fact or fiction is up for debate as well, just like uh, Sangila Utama. Some historians actually think that the literature is a compilation of folklore, whereas uh, uh, there are people who also think that he is a real historical figure, but maybe uh, the name is different. So it was also hypothesized that Hang Tua this, uh, was based off an actual individual, but the stories were exaggerated to make it more interesting or inspirational, okay? But the first uh, formal uh, site-specific record of crocodiles in Singapore is actually in 1823, where William Farquhar's pet dog, uh, he went to, into the Rocho River and then it was suddenly captured by a giant crocodile that was said to um, be about 5.5 meters in length. So Fakwa was so angry that he ordered his men to barricade the river and then he got his men to uh, kill the crocodile and hang the crocodile on a fig tree. Okay, so that was actually the first uh, formal records of crocodiles in Singapore. In 1852, um, because there was an increasing number of crocodile attacks on humans in Singapore, the government then actually offered rewards uh, to get rid of crocodiles from the island. So uh, the reward was actually said to be valued at around $5 uh, for a crocodile more than 9 feet in length. That's about 2.7 meters. Okay. And then in 1930s, uh, Singapore was actually beginning to lean towards the commercialization of crocodiles for crocodile skin, as well as for food, as well as some byproducts that can be used in traditional Chinese medicine. And there were private breeding pools that were created in the homes of some individuals, breeding pools for crocodiles. So in between, there was the World War II, but then uh, after that, the commercialization actually well advanced into the 1940s. But in 1960s, there was a boom in demand for crocodile skins, uh, and many, small, many smaller farms actually popped up in Singapore. Okay. Uh, in terms of wild crocodile sightings, in 1960, the year 1960, it was a very interesting year of crocodile sightings in Singapore. Okay, uh, for example, at um, Sungai Kadut in the north of Singapore, um, there was actually a live six feet, uh, 20 foot, uh, sorry, live six meter crocodile that was actually viewed as a sacred being by the villagers. And uh, the villagers were, the residents, they were so protective of this crocodile that they refused to disclose its location to anybody because they, they were scared that um, bad luck might be fall on the um, fishermen if the crocodile had actually shifted to another place. Okay, but in the same year, right, there were also other villagers 
that uh, were trying to get rid of crocodiles in uh, places like Pongo, as well as Balea Creek in uh, Pasir Panjang. So uh, 1960, the year 1960 can be considered like a year of crocodile sightings in Singapore. Okay. And then uh, in 1996, the Crocodile Specialist Group uh, of the International Union for Conservation of Nature actually assigned the status regionally extinct to saltwater crocodiles in Singapore under the IUCN Red List. And up to today, this status has not been changed. So at this point, you must be quite puzzled because, you know, if you go to Sungai Bulo today, you can still see wild crocodiles, right? So actually, this just means that the, um, the record has not, the status has not been updated yet. But uh, does this mean that the saltwater crocodile was actually formerly extinct in Singapore? And then maybe they made a return to Singapore waters, let's say, uh, maybe in the early 2000s. Okay, so let's explore the next question. Okay, the post should appear on your screen now. Did the saltwater crocodile formally go extinct in Singapore? Okay. So about 40% of you have voted. 60%. Okay, so uh, I'm going to end the poll now. Okay, and I'm going to share the results. So 68, the majority of you uh, said that no, saltwater crocodiles actually did not formally go extinct in Singapore, whereas 32% of you said yes. Okay, so let's explore this. Okay, the correct answer is most of you are correct. Um, no, saltwater crocodiles actually did not ever go extinct in Singapore. Okay, so um, even though it was classified as uh, regionally extinct in 1996, there was actually no evidence that this was ever the case. So my colleague Kate, she actually published a book titled This Guardian Island uh, very recently. And this book actually provides an overview of the continuous and unceasing presence of crocodiles in Singapore since records begin. So based on the records detailed in this book, right, there has been no decade that has passed without any reported crocodile sightings in Singapore. And there's well over 300 historical and present records of crocodiles in Singapore spanning over 200 years which shows that even though crocodiles, um, they were considered prey by the colonials, they endured threats of habitat, habitat destruction and commercial development and commodification, they actually never left our waters and um, they can be quite elusive, but uh, they were actually still around in our waters. Okay, so if you would like to download a copy of Kate's book, uh, the downloading link will be made available in our chat box. Okay, so this book actually hopefully serves as a basis for the revision of the IUCN status for saltwater crocodiles in Singapore as well. Okay, so with this, I will end my segment on folklore and myths related to Singapore's natural history, but our program is not over yet. So nowadays, right, we don't actually have a lot of folklore, right, because everything is very well documented. We have a variety of tools to document our findings, um, but we do actually still have a lot of misconceptions uh, that we have shared with us when you sign, uh, sign up for the workshop. And we actually thought of how we can dispel and correct some of these misconceptions using a common and fun theme. And we finally decided on doing a food edition. So my, uh, I think that this uh, food edition will be quite relatable to a lot of our participants today who like to, um, who are foodies, okay? So my colleague Chun Wei, she will be taking over now and she will tell you some fun facts about uh, food that you never knew about. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Jasha, for the interesting insights on Singapore's food laws and myths. So, although food is one of Singaporeans' favorite pastimes, there are still many things we do not know about them. So, today, let us dive deep into our steamboats and check out some of the common ingredients we tend to cook in them. All right. So, first up, one of some of the most important ingredients to have in the steamboat is actually our vegetables. All right. So there are actually a, quite a few common vegetables that are on the screen that we usually see in the markets. All right, so do you know, do you recognize all of them? All right, so if you don't, let's go through them one by one. So the first one is actually our broccolis. The second one is our Brussels sprouts. The third one is kailan. Uh, fourth one is cabbage. The fifth is the kill. And the last is actually our cauliflowers. All right, so now my poll question is, how many species of vegetables can you spot on the screen? All right, so the poll question should be out now. And there's actually three options. One is, okay, so the option A is one. 
Option B is three, option C is six. All right, so about 40% have voted already. Okay, so now it's about 80% of y'all have voted. So I will just end the poll now. All right, so let's share the results. So it's about 52% of y'all have actually voted for B, three species, and 12% uh, for one and 35% for six. So what is the correct answer? Okay, so the correct answer is, right, so at one glance, they actually look very different from each other, and it's easy to think that they are actually very different plants. However, they all belong to the same species. Okay, so they are actually known as the Brassica oleracea, just that they are different cultivars. So what is cultivars? So cultivars are actually, are actually are cultivars or cultivated varieties are actually plant varieties that have been produced in cultivation by selective breeding. So selective breeding actually involves the parents with particular characteristics to breed together and produce offspring that actually inherit these desirable characteristics. So for example, these carrots here, all right, so you can see on the screen, there's actually three different varieties of carrots. So let's say I like the color of the first carrot variety and the size of the second carrots. So I will try to keep uh, crossbreeding them and eventually maybe a lot of tries, of tries and generations of carrots later, I finally get the variety that I want the most, which is the orange and a very big carrot itself. All right, okay, so now let's go, let's go back to Brassica oleracea. So they're also known as the wild mustard plant or wild cabbage in this wild and cultivated form. So it is a biennial plant that uses food reserves that is stored over in the winter in the roses of the leaves to produce a spikes of few flowers at the end of a second summer before dying. So this actually nutritious leaves makes it uh, domesticated derivatives di di important food crops in much of the world now. So uh, this one plant will actually selectively bred over hundreds of years create dozens of rolling different vegetables. So by selecting and breeding plants with maybe bigger leaves, larger buds and all this, the different cultivars were created. So at one glance, these are the, uh, these are the different vegetables and what they are set up for. So now let's go to the individual vegetable itself. So the first ever domesticated, domesticated type of Brassica oleracea was actually found in Asian, Greek and Roman literature. So these leafy kills are considered the earliest cultivated brassicas originally used for human consumption or to feed livestock. They were actually created by making the leaves of the ancestor plants much more bigger. Okay, next, we have our Thailand. So according to the records of Asian literature in China, uh, they were actually found a form originated from southern China. So early in the 5th and the 6th century AD, the brassica aleracea, which could be eaten as vegetable, came from its originated region through Central Asia and then into China. So it was actually called the cabbage from the Western world. However, during, uh, in the Guangdong region, under the subtropical climate condition, there was a gene mutation and through long period of artificial selection, it becomes the now known Thailand itself. So the tender leaves and the flower buds, they are all edible. Okay, next up, we have our cabbage. So cabbage was actually created from a kill cultivar in the 1200s by selecting for a large terminal buds, which is the growing end at the top of the plant. So the leaves are tightly wound around a short and white stem, which is the cabbage core. So this is how your cabbage looks like now. Okay, next up, we have our tiny cabbages, but they're actually known as the Brussels sprouts. All right, so instead of growing at the the growing end at the top of the plant, they actually grow from the buds along the plant stems. So these buds along the plant stems, they are known as the lateral buds. So as the name suggests, they actually first originated in the Belgian towns and was recorded to be sold in markets as early as, 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 early as in the 1200s as well. Okay, so the second last, the broccoli was also created from a kale predecessor, predecessor in the, during the Asian Roman times in Italy by selecting for the large flower clusters, which are then harvested before they bloom. And the last one, the cauliflower, they were actually developed from one of the hundreds of broccoli varieties. So the cauliflower actually produces a terminal cluster, which are made out of immature flower buds, whereas the broccoli clusters are made out of the flower buds itself. Okay, so the next one, we also have another type of vegetable. They are actually known as the bell peppers or more commonly known as the capsicum. All right, so this is also yet another common vegetable that we, vegetables that we see in our dishes or sometimes in our steamboats also. So in the supermarkets, right, we usually see different colors of bell peppers, red, orange, yellow, and green. 
So some believe that they are from different plants, while others believe that they are the same bell peppers at different stages of ripening. So there was actually one viral tweet that say that eventually blows it out and got everyone discussing. So this lady over here actually says that she thinks that the green peppers turns yellow, then turn orange, and then red, and they're all the same pepper, just less ripe. Okay, so now let's discuss. Are they the same pepper at different ripening stages? So there'll be a poll questions coming up now. All right, so are they the same peppers at different ripening stages? Wow, the results are quite close. It's like 50, 50, 49, 51, okay. All right, any more, any more answers? Wow, now it's really 50-50, okay. <laughs> All right, let's end the poll now. Okay, so you can see from the result itself, 50% of y'all say yes, 50% of y'all say no. That's a very, very close fight itself. All right, okay, so the actual answer is, uh, what the lady said was actually false, all right? So they are not the same pepper uh, of different ripening stages itself. So although they are so in a variety of colors, right? Actually, most of these peppers, they are, they are indeed green when they are unripe, but they are not necessarily the same pepper. So each cardinal variety actually has a specific final color and they can go through the various other colors to get, to get there. For example, one variety may, may start out green and then ripen to red. But another variety may start out green and then turn yellow, then red itself. So different variety, they actually have a different final set of colors they will actually go through. All right. So peppers, right, they only change colors and also the flavors while ripening on the plants. They can be picked at any color stages. However, once you pick it from the plant itself, the colors does not change anymore. A bell pepper that is picked when it is green will not turn yellow or red uh, when you put it on the table for a few days. All right. So... Climateric fruits actually refers to fruits that continue to ripen after harvested. So some of the examples here include your apple, your avocado, your tomato, and your papaya. So these are actually climateric fruits that will continue to ripen after you pick it from the plants itself. However, because the bell peppers does not ripen after it's picked from the plants, they are known to be non-climateric as the ripening process itself is actually regulated by the plant's hormones. Okay, so let's that's, that's enough for our vegetables. Let's look at something else instead. All right, so now we have this. I guess most of you have eaten this before. It's a, our very common ingredient that we love to put in our steamboat. It's actually the crab sticks. But are they really crab sticks? So are these crab sticks really made out of crab meat? So I'm going to put out a poll question and you can choose yes or no. All right, 70% has voted, 80%. All right, since 80% has voted, I will end the poll now. Okay, let's see the results. Okay, so the results is actually very obvious. Everybody chose no, and only 8% of you all have chosen yes. All right, so yes, the majority of you all is correct. Uh, there's actually no crab meats in the crab state itself. So the common crab states found in the markets are not made out of actual crab meats, although the name may suggest otherwise. The main ingredients are actually starch with finely pulverized white fish meat known as the surimi itself. So surimi is actually refers to the fish flesh that has been deboned, wash to remove fats and unwanted bits, and then mince into a paste. So if there's a particular fish, pollock, which has a very mild color and odor, is commonly used to make this surimi itself. So this fish is also often used to make other fish sticks or other breaded fish products itself. Okay, so these crab sticks, right, it generally contains no crab other than a tiny amount of crab extract that is sometimes added for flavoring itself. Okay, so why is it called the crab stick then? This is because they are shaped and cured to resemble the leg meat of the snow crab or Japanese spider crab. So this is a photo of the Japanese spider crab in the museum. So Japanese spider crab is actually known as the largest crabs in the world. With the pincers stretched out, they can grow up to 3.8 meters long. So they're actually geographically found off the coast of Japan and Taiwan and is considered a delicacy in Japan. All right, so now let's move on to some real seafood then. Okay, so over here we have a squid. So for those who have handled squid and cooked it yourself, you'll realize that there is this plastic-like thing in the squid. Some people think that it's actually a marine plastic taken in by the squid itself, especially if, let's say, if you, have a, if you order a calamari dish and they were not prepared properly and some of this maybe end up in your food itself. 
But before we reveal the answer of what is, what is it exactly, let's get to know more about squids in general. So squids actually belongs to the phylum Mollusca and the class Cephalopoda. So Mollusca is also known as soft in Latin. So animals in this phylum are known to have soft bodies, and some of them, like your clams and mussels, have hard shells to protect themselves. Cephalo actually refers to heads, and poda refers to legs in the Latin also. All right, so animals in the class Cephalopoda are characterized by a completely merged head and foot with a ring of arms or tentacles surrounding the head itself. Some of these cephalopods have external shells like your nautilus, and whereas some of them have no shells at all like your otopus. Okay, so now let's take a look at a video here. So my colleague here, Jia Xuan, is actually removing the plastic light thing from the squid. So let's see how she removed it. You can see her pushing out the All right. Okay, so she, she removed the, the, the thing itself. So, okay, any guesses? Okay, so for now, you can actually guess that this plastic thing, right, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, are the shell of the squids. All right, so the pen or gladius of this squid, right, is actually an internalized shell. So it's made out of chitin and serves as a site of attachment for important muscle groups and as a protective barrier for the organs itself. All right, okay, next up. I guess many of us have eaten this before, the fish maw, but do you know which part of the fish that the fish maw belongs to? So there's no poll question for this question, but you can type your guesses in the chat box below. Okay, I see mouth, I see swim leather, stomach. Tail, okay. Okay, most of you wrote bladder, stomach also. All right, skin, internal organ. Okay, all right, so I guess most of most of majority of you actually got it correct. So it's actually the swim bladder. So fish moi is actually a dried swim bladder that comes from a large fish like a croaker or the sturgeon itself. In Asian culture, it's considered to be one of the top four delicacies of the sea, which includes your abalone, sea cucumber, shark fin, and fish maw. In appearance, the dried fish maw is light, white in color, and have a spongy texture. So this swim bladder right, is actually an internal gas field organ that helps to control the buoyancy for bony fishes, uh, allowing them to stay at the water depth without the need to continuously swimming. This actually helps them to save energy. So how is fish more prepared? Well, starting with a longitudinal cut along the fish itself, the swim bladder is removed and washed several times to clean away blood vessels or any exterior tissues. After being cleaned thoroughly, the swim bladders are laid out to dry in the sun until partially dry, where they are then smoked in sulfur for many hours. From this stage, they are either sold to merchants to further process into fat forms for packaging and sale. The dry processed swim bladders must then be rehydrated for culinary or medicinal use through soaking. However, this trade is actually pushing some of the sea species to the brink of extinction with overfishing. An example would be vaquita, the world's smallest porpoise, which is a cousin to the dolphins with less than 10 individuals. So over here, you can see a few news articles about how this fish trade is actually, this fish mouth trade is actually pushing the animals to extinction. All right, so for this uh, vaquita itself, there's only less than 10 individuals remaining in the Gulf of California in 2020. As much as we love our food, we shouldn't love them to extinction. Hence, it's important, important for us to know where our food sources and eat sustainably. All right. Okay. So for the past hour, right, we have about we have dived deep into the history and learned about the different food tales and myths related to Singapore's natural history and cleared some common misconceptions of our food. But now let's take a look at some of the questions that were posted to us by you guys when you're registered for the talk shop. Okay, so uh, we received a number of questions uh, when you all sign up for the talk shop. Uh, we pick up a uh, we pick up a few. Okay, the first one we have is uh, sharks aggressive creatures that attack on site. Um, there are actually hundreds of species of sharks. Uh, probably more than three hundred species of sharks, and only a dozen of them are potentially dangerous to humans. And for humans, right, we are actually not the preferred diet of sharks. Most of the shark species, they tend to eat 
smaller fishes or invertebrates. Um, and shark attacks on humans are exceedingly rare, actually. You might think that it happens often because uh, you know, you can, it can be a common plot line in movies or news on shark attacks can be quite sensationalized. But uh, shark attacks are rare and usually even if it happens, right, it uh, doesn't cause uh, fatality. So some of the reasons why sharks may attack humans may be because um, they confuse humans for their actual prey, which may happen especially if the water is, let's say, not so clear and uh, if the reflection or refraction of the water projects an illusion. So um, sharks are actually not aggressive to humans. Okay. Uh, the second one is, does peeing on jellyfish sting wounds help to treat them? Uh, the short answer is uh, no, please do not try it. Uh, peeing on your wound might actually aggravate, uh, trigger the jellyfish uh, unactivated stingers to uh, inject more venom into your bloodstream and this actually causes more pain. So um, the best thing you can do, especially in Singapore, is you seek help from a lifeguard or you go to a hospital immediately. So uh, in the first place, it's not very hygienic. Sometimes the concentration of the salt in your urine, uh, depends on how much water you drink that day or uh, what kind of food you eat also. So, um, uh, so one advice that people actually give right, is never to use fresh water because uh, jellyfish, they, they stay in salt water, right? And fresh water, the salt concentration is lower and the difference in salt concentration might actually trigger the jellyfish to uh, activate the stingers and uh, inject more venom into you. And this applies to your urine as well. Depending on how much water you drink, the concentration of salt also differs. Okay, so uh, all bats are blind and fruit bats are related to COVID-19. Uh, these are actually two separate questions that we merge together. So um, the one regarding all bats are blind is actually not true. Bats are actually not blind. They can use their sense of vision to detect prey or um, to detect predators or navigate around. It's just that in a pitch dark environment, there are actually species of bats that prefer to use echolocation, uh, meaning they produce sound waves that will bounce off uh, objects and then back to them, and this helps them to navigate around. And But the visual abilities of bats uh, differs across the species as well. So some bats, like your fruit bats, um, they have pretty good vision actually, and they don't, some of them don't actually echolocate at all. Okay, the one regarding fruit bats are related to COVID-19. Um, up to now, we, we um, researchers, they still don't know the exact origin of COVID-19, right? And the exact cause has not been pinned down yet. So it's very premature to uh, say that bats were the ones that transmitted the disease to humans. And in the first place, we shouldn't be villainizing bats because it's actually uh, our increasing interference with wildlife or wild animals that is the root of the problem. So actually humans are the one bridging the distance between wild animals and us with our various activities like clearing their habitats. So we are the ones stepping into their domains and, uh, the, and the habitats of these wild animals. And the animals are like forced to be closer to us and this gives rise or gives, uh, uh, gives rise for the opportunity for the viruses to jump ship from, from the animals to humans. So it's really sad to see a lot of uh, COVID-related backlash against bats or any other animals per se. Um, and I think that bats are actually gravely misunderstood and undervalued because they actually pollinate a lot of our crops, including the durians that we eat. So we shouldn't be, be pointing our fingers at bats or any other animals. And I think what is really needed is a re-evaluation or reassessment of the relationship between uh, humans and nature instead. Okay? So uh, maybe the next question. All right. So was lion really found in Singapore? So everyone knows that skin of beast is not found on Singapore. In fact, lions are actually has never occurred anywhere near the dense forest of the equatorial tropics. They actually prefer the open and dry habitats uh, of woodland savannas. So like what Josh Chen mentioned earlier, right? San Ila Utama story might have actually been a myth. So even if the story was true, it's most likely to be a tiger instead of a lion. Okay, the next one is quite interesting. Okay, anything red is poisonous. All right, so this is definitely not true. If that is true about the fruits that we eat, like cherries, strawberries, apples, and all this. However, it's a fact that many animals with deadly poison or venom tend to be in bright colors, such as red, yellow, or even blue. So a classic example would be the vividly colored poison dark frogs. So these bright colors actually serve as a warning coloration to warn the potential predators to not to eat them. All right. Okay. okay. So these so are these just are the, some of the questions, questions from, from the participants. participants. 
Okay, so now we'll move on to the Q&A during the session itself. Okay, so we will pick a few questions. Where can you find dugongs in Singapore? Uh, dugong trails are not necessarily the dugongs itself, but dugong trails, they are feeding trails because they feed on seagrass, right? So if there's like empty spaces or an uh, empty trail among the seagrass, um, uh, it's, it's sort of an evidence that you can find dugongs in Singapore. So places where you can find these kind of trails, right, have been spotted in places like Changi, um, Labrador, as well as Pulau Ubin and Pulau Tekong. And we, we have people that have spotted dugong swimming around our uh, northern waters nearer to the Johor Streets as well. Okay, so these are places, potential places you can find dugongs in Singapore. Okay, okay so amenities uh, found in Denmark. Okay, okay so, so someone is asking this since, since there's, there's a story, story for the Little Mermaid that's originated in Denmark itself. So, Manatees are not found in Denmark. They are found at the Caribbean Sea, uh, the Amazon basins, West Africa and North America. So the Little Mermaid is actually a Danish literary fairy tale written by a Danish author. So we are not too sure if it's related to manatees uh, in general itself. All right. Okay, the next one. So is kills a uh, uh, superfood or are, are all these derivatives also superfoods? Okay, so there's actually no scientifically based or regulated definition for superfood, but generally a food is considered superfood if it's, it offers high levels of desirable nutrients itself. Okay, okay, and I don't saw water crocodiles from Australia. Australia. Can't they have just swam all the way from Australia into the rivers of Sungai Mulo? Okay, so some of the crocodiles actually have a very wide range. Yes, they can be found in Australia, but they're also found in Southeast Asia too. Okay, uh, the fifth question, is caliva the same as variety? Okay, so caliva actually means the cultivated variety. So variety is actually reproduced naturally. Cultivated variety is actually has some human interventions. So there are many more differences between the two, but in general, this is the major difference. So one is uh, made by humans, the other is actually natural. Okay, are tomatoes and potatoes fruits or vegetables? Okay, tomatoes are botanically classified as fruits because they contain seeds and, uh, and um, also from the flowers of the the tomato plant itself. Then potatoes are, actually, are botanically classified as vegetables. They are actually from the roots of the plants. Okay, so are Portuguese men of war jellyfish? Okay, it is easy to mistake the Portuguese men of war as jellyfish because they do look like them, but they are not jellyfish. It's a type of animal called the siphonophore. It is only it's only not a single animal, but actually a colony of animals. So they are made out of four pops, uh, polyps working together, and each polyp is actually an individual organism. So they are extremely dangerous and can kill. Sometimes they go by the name of the blue bottle because of the purple-blue color of the pneumatal force itself, which is a gas-filled bladder. All right. Okay. So, okay, we are reaching the end of our, our presentation already. So now... Uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, our, our Thursday talk show today. So I hope you all learn more about the different footloads, myth and misconception itself. Okay, so now I would just like you all to help us with a little feedback so that uh, to find, and if you want to find out more about our education programs, you can actually visit our websites over here too. Okay, you can actually scan the QR code or the link on, at the top. So my, my colleague also have placed the link in the chat box for you all too for the feedback itself. So thank you everyone and happy World Crocodile Day. And for the students, please enjoy the rest of your holidays. <laughs>